moving. Let's go ahead and jump over to the wide receiver position where we've had this debate before, right? With uh, in, over the off season, uh, right around free agency time, after the trade happened, we had a big show with a lot of people on, and we really had a really heated discussion about this. But DeAndre Hopkins is going at wide receiver three, one ten overall, right? First round. I'm selling DeAndre Hopkins at one ten wide receiver three. Um, I do not think that his target share is going to be what it was last year. Uh, right, last year he's he commanded thirty point nine um, target share in two thousand nineteen. He had one hundred and fifty targets. He was eighth in total target distance and tenth in air yards, second in weighted opportunity rating, and second in market share of air yards. Now, <clears throat> looking at the Cardinals, right? So last year the Cardinals were ninth in pass attempts per game. I think there is certainly room to grow there, and that they could end up actually being higher than that. Because I do think this offense takes another step forward. However, you know Christian Kirk is still there, who played 13 games, had 108 targets, had 24.9% of the targets. Larry Fitzgerald had 109 targets, 20% target share. Now, obviously, I do think that that DeAndre or that Larry Fitzgerald probably drops a little bit. I will agree there. That's that's probably 100% going to happen. I don't think he disappears. I think people think that like all of a sudden he's just going to completely fall off this cliff. I think it's going to happen. I still think he's going to get his. But my biggest concern with him is I think they're going to go play much, much more into a four wide receiver set, which I think is going to then spread the ball out much, a lot more because that's what the Cliff Kingsbury offense wants. Which, so for me, I think wide receiver three is just too high for me, for him. I think that I would much rather have some of the wide receivers that are going after him. And so for me, that is why I'm a sell on DeAndre Hopkins. Because if you look at the Houston Texans offense, he was the man. It was Will Fuller who was always hurt, and then nobody, right? That is not – you cannot say that now with this offense. Not that – I and I'm not saying – because I think Christian Kirk is, is really a much better value than what than what he should be. I think he's going much later than he should be. I think he should be valued as a wide – I think he has wide receiver two upside, and I would much rather take that than DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, I, th- I think at wide receiver three, you're kind of you're buying him at his ceiling. I'm outside of some crazy touchdown variants. I, I really don't see a a path where he can where he can finish as wide receiver one. Um, there are some guys like you said who are going after him who I'd feel more comfortable projecting them into that role, like Tyreek Hill, like a Julio Jones. Um, I mean, he's even going. According to this, what I just pulled up, he's he's going ahead of Adams right now. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. So this updated now. If you from from yesterday to today, he's actually moved up. So now he's at one hundred and nine wide receiver two, and that is yeah, that's way too much. Yeah, you're you're buying him at his at his highest possible lock. Like obviously a wide receiver two, there's not going to be too much room to go up from there. But like I think that is like at the height of his of his range of outcomes, and I think there's. Um, obviously a much better shot that he finishes is like a, I still think he has, he has wide receiver one year. Um, I'm not too worried about them spreading out the ball because if you look at uh, how things have been trending over the past couple of years with more, you know, wide receiver twos for, for an NFL team getting involved in the passing game, like we're not seeing a lot of guys coming out with 170, 180, 190 targets. Uh, if you look last year, I think there was only five, uh, receivers who had more than 150 targets, uh, Michael Thomas, Julio Jones, A-Rob, Edelman, and then uh, D-Hop had 150 on the nose. So I don't think that's that's a prerequisite how it used to be in, in years past. I still think you can obviously produce wide receiver one seasons with getting that 140-ish range. But like I said, you're you're buying him at his at his utmost ceiling, and you're not giving him too much too much room to 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 move around there. And there are a couple of those guys I'd rather have behind him. Yeah, I agree. So uh, I'm just I just a sell for me. So let's let's go ahead and move on to the next guy, and we're gonna go to Odell Beckham, right? And Odell Beckham has turned into more of a name in recent and recent years. Than fantasy producer. Um, if you look at him last year, he was a, had 133 targets, was 12, 74 receptions, just just barely eclipsed a thousand yards with 1,034, four touchdowns, 12.6 fantasy points per game, which was 33rd 
However, th- there is some reason for some optimism here because he was third in air yards. He was tied for fourth in weighted opportunity rating. Um, so those are all things that I – and third in total target distance. However, I, I don't – I can't help but to feel like a lot of this you, you could pin on some, uh, some Baker Mayfield because Baker Mayfield, so he was 6.4 – 6.45 target accuracy, which was 88th in the league among wide receivers. So every target he got, uh, he was 88th in the league in that. And then Baker Mayfield was inaccurate with a 69.5 adjusted completion percentage, which was 36th in the league, right? So I feel like that if Baker can take a step forward this year and kind of bounce back and be the guy that we thought he can be, I think with the new offense, with Stefanski here, I think, you know, where they do more play action, and everything else, I think Odell can actually be a pretty significant bounce back candidate here. And he's going at wide receiver 10 at 307. So mid third round. And if you know, if you start running back, running back, like getting Odell Beckham, which uh, years past is normally going in the first round, early second, get him at 307 is a pretty decent value. And so I definitely think that there is room for growth here with Odell. And this this really, this Browns offense as a whole, where we kind of got, everybody got way too excited about them too early last year, and they kind of fell on their face. Well, that whole situation was a disaster. I think Baker takes a big step forward this year, and I think Odell Beckham does as well. So I, I like Odell Beckham. I am buying Odell Beckham in the third round. Yep, I'm going to buy as well. Uh, not too much more to add here. Just, just the fact of... It can't get much worse than what it was last year, right? So even even if there was just like a slight uptick, and that has to be like one of the quietest like one thousand yard receiving seasons in in recent memory, especially coming from somebody like Odell. I think it's just like you said, it's it's the name, and we we just expect so much more. Um, obviously, the touchdowns weren't there. He had the lowest catch percentage that he's had in his entire career, and that's with playing with uh, you know the the goat Eli Manning. Um, so I, I think if they're just like a slight uptick in efficiency, if Baker can take that next step forward, I think he pays off this wide receiver 10 price. Um, and one, one of the – so I used coach speak to throw it out the window. Now I'm going to use it here because it fits my narrative. But Stefanski, one of the first things he said uh, whenever – during one of his press conferences was they want to get him more involved. So I'm going to use that here, and I'm going to push that away on the Cam Akers talk from, uh, from earlier. Because that's that's how we do things. Yeah, no, that's how all fantasy football works, right? You use stuff to support your narrative, and then also to, um, so I don't know. So we'll see. I don't know. But uh, like I said, I think we're both we both agree on Odell. Now let's let's go ahead and jump over to Juju Smith Schuster, which is also interesting because again, he's more of I think of a guy who last year everybody was super excited about was going as a top ten wide receiver for most people. People were slamming the draft button for jo- uh, for Juju. Now it's kind of like people have soured on him a little bit. Now he's still going in the fourth, early fourth round, 403 wide receiver 15. I think you could probably see him go in that 15, wide receiver 15 to 20 range for some people. And I think for me, I'm buying that. I think this offense, now that, that the tough part here really is the fact is can Big Ben stay healthy, right? We've been seeing Big Ben get out there on the field and practicing. He's been practicing all offseason so far. And he's, you know, there's been reports out there he's been working with his wide receivers. But this is a, you know, this is kind of a big year for Juju, right? Because I believe this is a, con- he's heading into a contract year. Yep. Contract years are undefeated. There's the rumors out there that the Je- the the Steelers uh, are, have no interest in bringing him back, which seems ridiculous to me. Because if there was somebody that you wanted to build your franchise around as like a, um, a brand and everything else, it's Juju Smith Schuster. Like he is the nicest dude out there. Um, just seems like a really good person. And so like not wanting to build your brand around that, I don't know. But regardless of that, I think Juju does bounce back this year. And so for me, I, I think you end up like I, I would love that start. Again, if you took two running backs, then you, you know, if you don't you want to go wide receiver, wide receiver, like I said, you know, go Odell here and then maybe Juju in the next round. Like I think that's a really great start. I think this is a nice bounce back year for them. The only concern I have, the only concern I have is can Big Ben stay healthy, right? I don't know why that I feel like that they would have been a great landing spot. Maybe for uh, you know an Andy Dalton type, somebody like that as a really strong backup there in Pittsburgh, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I was I was out last year on how highly he was going and the all the buzz he was getting. I mean, he was a I think he was a back of the first pick. 
Um, I know in, in dynasty circles, there were some people that had him as high as the wide receiver one for dynasty. I, I can never get on board with that. But at this point, at, at wide receiver fourteen, at wide receiver fifteen, at four oh three, I can definitely get on board with this because if you look at the guys who are going after him, I'll just throw out some names: uh, DJ Moore, AJ Brown, Robert Woods, Keenan Allen, DK Metcalf. Finish out the the top twenty. Nobody has the target upside that Juju has, like you said, if Ben can stay healthy. Because if you look behind Juju, I know you're a I know you're a big Deontay guy. Um, I'm I'm a little lower on him, but like then it's James Washington. It's, I don't know, man. Just, there's that that entire wide receiver room is just a is a whole bunch of question marks, which makes your point even even stronger about like if you're gonna sign somebody and pay them, that's the guy you want to sign because if they don't have him next year, it's gonna be super ugly. Um, like I said, n- nobody else going after him has that high target upside. I mean, I think you can be look at him as. 160, 170 for for Juju just because of everything else around him. So I will be buying there as well. Yeah. So all right. So we both we both agree there. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one, and let's jump over to DJ Chark. Right. And again, I'm sorry. These next two guys that we're going to talk about, I'm a little surprised with with around um, how far they're going, like how low they're going now. So DJ Chark is going at wide receiver 26 at 510. Um he's he is the number one wide receiver in that offense. Um and I think there's there's a lot to like here with DJ Chark, especially like I said, at wide receiver 26, he's he's going as a wide receiver three. And so for me, I mean if you look at just what he was able to do last year, uh he was 19th in fantasy points per game. This was his second year in the league. I mean, he kind of came out of nowhere as well. Like nobody was expecting this from him with what he is able to do last year, 73 receptions, 1,008 yards, eight total touchdowns, which was eighth in the league, uh, 25 deep targets, which was 14th in the league, uh, 117 targets. Like, there's a lot to like here. He committed almost 22% of the, the targets in this offense. Um, Jacksonville was forced to throw a lot. Like, I don't think their defense is going to be any better than it was last year. I think this is a team that's going to have to throw the ball a ton. And so with all that being said, like, I really like DJ Chark as being probably the number one wide receiver in this offense. Um, they did add LaVisca Chenault, you know, through the draft. Uh, D.D. Westbrook is still there. But for, for me, like, I think he is somebody that should be considered, a, you know, a wide receiver too. I think I have him as a wide receiver 20 right now. So I have him uh, well above his ADP. And so, I don't know, I, I'm a clear buy on this one. Yep, we're going to be on the on the same page with this one as well. Um, like you said, he's, he's going to be the wide receiver one on that team. Not... I'm really interested to see how they use uh, LaVisca Chenault, but I don't think that having another target like that is going to really take away too much from him. And I think the reason why he's kind of slipped a little bit compared to, you know, how how he performed last year was he kind of tailed off toward the end of the year, right? He came out the gate hot. Uh, look at his fantasy points from last year on a week weekly basis. Look at 24, 18, 17, 8, blew up with 36. And then after that, it kind of tails off a little bit. He has a 19-point game in there and a 30-point game. But outside of that, like there's there was not a lot going on. So I think that's why you're seeing him slip. And if you're looking at some of the guys who are going after that, and this is why I like drafting based on tiers rather than just like a straight rankings list or you know, looking at ADP if you're gonna do it that way. There aren't too many other receivers going after him where you can look and say for sure without a shadow of a doubt that he is the team's wide receiver one. I mean, you're looking at Terry McLaurin. I guess you could throw him out there. Um, Marquise Brown, but, like, that's not going to be a a high-volume offense. Like I said, after that, it's just, like, you're not looking at anyone else who you're looking at and saying, like, okay, this guy is going to be the one. So um, at, at this point, man, I think he's a clear buy as well. All right, so let's go to Tyler Boyd. Why don't you tell us uh, where I already know what you're going to say, but tell the folks why does he were 35 at 801 uh, seems a bit ridiculous. Rodney Dangerfield up in here. He can't get no respect. Um, I, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me either. The dude finished as I think in half PPR anyway, he was like wide receiver 21 last year, if I'm not mistaken. I think the year before that he was wide receiver 16. And if you look at his situation last year, like awful 
completely dreadful that that entire offense the quarterback situation there was nothing going in his favor and he still finished really well last year he still had a still had a strong finish um and outside of him like i aj green like who knows what what's going to come of him who knows if he's going to be be able to stay healthy um Auden tate obviously t higgins coming in they spend a high cap high draft capital on him but I'm not looking at any of them as guys that are going to be really, really pushing him. I, I think he's the clear one in that offense as well. And I like the, the wide receiver 35 just does not make any sense to me whatsoever. I don't know if you can you can make any sense of that, but I, I certainly can. The only thing I can think of with him is I think people look at you know the addition of T. Higgins and then AJ Green coming back and being healthy, and so and then. Uh, John Ross as well, who started off strong last year. So many people feel like that he's not going to command 25% of the targets, which is what he got last year. He was actually seventh in the league in targets with 147, um, but he was 27th in the league with, with fantasy points per game at 13.9. But as you mentioned, their quarterback play was atrocious. They're for what, you know, they, they were taking last year, so they decided to set the red rocket. And so for the most of the year last year, I mean, his, his quarterback room was absolutely horrific. And so... There was nobody else. He as while he was the main target there in that offense for most of the season because no AJ Green and everything else. The the quarterback play was so horrific. Now with Joe Burrow coming in, uh, I do think that obviously is a big upgrade for them. So for me, I, that is a definite buy for me. Like I yeah, I don't. You shouldn't be overvaluing AJ Green, right? Like I don't know what AJ Green has left to take, and I don't even know what motivation he has left. To be honest with you, uh, he clearly did not want to come back. They they franchise tagged him. Which I thought was the the most ridiculous thing ever. Uh, let the guy go and try to get a championship, you know, one time in his career before it's time for him to hang it up. But I, I can't understand some of the narrative for people that maybe that this is a really crowded situation. Like I said, AJ Green. But for me, I, I think it's pretty clear. Like I still think that he's probably still the the guy who commands most of the target share. I think that he certainly will be in the slot, which is uh, a very valuable targets there. I think at best you probably see A.J. Green on the outside and then T. Higgins on the other side with Tyler Boyd in the slot and with a, a rookie quarterback with no tight end, right? I mean, who do they have at tight end um, there as well? So I, I think that's also a positive for him. So the all the all the risk is gone with him. At wide receiver 35, that's just a little bit ridiculous to me. I think that he's, he's somebody that, again, has wide receiver two upside and you're getting him almost at a wide receiver four value. So – I, I'm all about Tyler Boyd. Yeah, I mean that that one's been one that's been sticking out to me this uh, this entire off season. I just I really I really don't understand why he's going why he's going as late as he is, especially considering his track track record over the past two years. Like I said last year, that that situation couldn't have been any worse for for that entire offense, and he still finished with ninety over a thousand yards receiving and, and five touchdowns. So. He's a clear he's a clear buy for me, and I I think he's being treated somewhat similarly in, in dynasty as well. So he's uh, he's someone that I'm going to be targeting on on dynasty teams as well as my redraft for 2020. All right, so the last part of this, so I, you know, when I was looking through all the ADP, I noticed that most of these wide receivers are going basically within two or three rounds of each other, the rookie wide receivers. Mm -hmm. So. More often than not, I typically do not like to take rookie wide receivers um, in redraft because they are so volatile. However, uh, I do think that this year is going to be a little bit different, and I think there's a couple of them that I really want. So which rookie wide receiver or wide receivers are you buying in 2020 in redraft? You have Jerry Judy going 809 at wide receiver 40, Henry Ruggs going 907 at wide receiver 42, CeeDee Lamb 912, wide receiver 43, Justin Jefferson, this surprised me actually a little bit, 10.09 at wide receiver 47. This one also surprised me. Jalen Rager going 11.03, wide receiver 49. And then Michael Pittman going very close to him at 11.10, uh, 11, wide receiver 51. If you had to pick two out of that group that you really wanted, who would it be? Number one, the easy number one here is Jalen Rager. Like that, that one to me, like out of this group, he has, I think, the clearest path to targets. Um, and also, uh, like I, I – he, he's out of this group. He's going to have the most targets, and he's also going to be the wide receiver one on his team. Um, obviously, with Rager, the thing you have to worry about, I guess, is the uh, the involvement of the tight ends there. But you, you don't go out and get some somebody like Jalen Rager and just 
give him 60 targets in a, in a season. So he like that one to me just does not make any sense. Like easily give me regular at that price over anybody else, over Judy, over lamb, all those guys. Um, the second one I'll pick, man, I think I'm going to, this one's tough for the second one, because like I said, I think it's so clearly regular over, over everybody else. The second one, give me, uh, give me Judy. Uh, I think it's going to be that that 1A, 1B situation in Denver. I think there's going to be enough targets to go between those two. And with 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 how much of a technician he is, man, I, I don't think that he's going – and how good he is after the catch, I don't think he's someone that we need to see him get 140 targets. I think he can get you, you know, 110 and uh, and still give you like a, a back-end wide receiver two season on the on those kind of targets. So – Rager, easily the one here, no questions asked. And then uh, I'll take Judy at two. Yeah, so for me, I think number one is Justin Jefferson for me, um, which shouldn't be surprised to you. But I love Justin Jefferson. I think he's in a fantastic situation in Minnesota. We know that they removed on from Stephon Dick, so he immediately steps in and speeds the wide receiver two in that offense. I think he's the most polished wide receiver, at least ready NFL-ready wide receiver. I think whether they play him in the slot, whether they play him on the outside, I think he can do both. Uh, I think the the targets are going to be there for him. I and uh, with him going as late, I was surprised tenth round. I think I suspect as we get training camp going, um, and and we start to learn a little bit more, I do think that Jefferson probably starts to rise. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's actually the first wide receiver taken in redraft. Now that and that's where it's going to get tricky for me because if he were to start going in like the sixth, seventh round. I probably would be out on that just because I think that's a little bit too much volatility there for a rookie wide receiver. I would never really want to take a rookie wide receiver that early um, unless it was just a clear cut. Now with Jalen Rager, I love Jalen Rager as well. We know this. This is a Jalen Rager friendly podcast. The thing that 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 does worry me with him is more so that I do think there are certainly more mouths there. And I don't like using that cliche of the more mouths to feed, but that's really what it is. Because you have Zach Ertz, you have Dallas Goddard. They're, they're going to run a tw- ton of 12 personnel. Deshaun Jackson is still there, and he is certainly going to get his deep targets. Alshon Jeffrey, we have to see what's going to happen. We've heard different things with them. Either he's going to start the year on the pup. Not that I think that these guys that are better than him, I 100% believe Jalen Rager is better than they are, but those guys are going to get targets. And if, and if Alshon Jeffrey is able to be healthy by the time the season starts, he's certainly going to get opportunities. And so is Deshaun Jackson. So is Zach Ertz. So it becomes more of a much more of a situation where I don't know if it is in terms of target wise. I don't know if it's going to be that clear cut for Jalen Rager. So I love Jalen Rager. And if he continues to go where he's going in the 11th round, all about it. Give me that. I'll take it. I will take him there. But if he were to be a guy that starts rising much more than that, unless a lot of things change, that's where I would be uh, have, have a problem with taking Jalen Rager that high. So for me, I think my number two would probably be Jerry Judy. Um, I agree with all the stuff you said. I think it's a very similar situation to what uh, that Justin Jefferson is is in Denver. That it's basically Cort- Cortland Sutton, and then you have uh, Noah Fant, and that's kind of it, right? Bayshon Hamilton's still there, but he's that hasn't really ever done anything to break out. So right now, I mean, it, it, he's kind of that that uh, obvious choice as the number two target there. And I think this is a you know being in the AFC West, they're going to have to throw the ball. Uh, I think all these offenses kind of got better outside of maybe Sandy or outside of the Chargers because of, of the Tyrod Taylor situation. But overall, I think these all these offenses in this division are going to push you. They're going to have to throw the ball more, and they're not, I don't think they're going to be able to run the ball as much as they want to. So with that being said, I think things kind of line up for Jerry Judy. I, I do want to ask you, because now we've kind of got this far out of it, um, what is your thoughts on Henry Ruggs? Is it still the same as what it was before? Because – I can see some upside with him, um, with with him. And if you go look on our YouTube channel, like that was, it's been one of our like kind of our uh, video that's just kind of like taken off, and a lot of people yeah. have watched. And like I see the upside there, right? Because he has the wheels. I think he he is uh, strong at contested catches. You know, you see it at Alabama, but there's so many red flags with him. And my other issue with Henry Ruggs still is the fact that I don't know if Derek Carr. While Derek Carr, if you look at his uh, deep ball completion percentage numbers. Like his uh, his accuracy was was fantastic. However, the actual attempts and volume was just not there, and so that for me is a red flag. Now you could make the argument that who was their deep threat that they really had, right? And so maybe that is something that that, that we're kind of overlooking with with Derek Carr, and that's what we feel like. So 
I think there's a lot of upside there for Derek or for Henry Ruggs and could end up being honestly the second or high, third highest scoring rookie wide receiver um, for 2020 because of the opportunities that are there. Because literally, if you if you really want to talk about opportunity, he probably has the clearest path to, to targets, right? Because it's Darren Waller and then Tyrell Williams, right? I mean, who, who, who else do they have? How dare you, sir? Are you forgetting about Brian Edwards? And, oh, no. I, I did not forget about Brian How Edwards. How dare you? But I'm talking about players that are already established that are there. Yeah, Brian Edwards. What you, <laughs> yeah, uh, um, for for Ruggs, it's they're mainly the same. Um, I would want him in a best ball league. I don't know if I want to deal with that headache if, with a uh, with a regular redraft league. I don't think that he is only a deep threat. But the thing with him is, you don't want to hamstring or hamper somebody's uh, potential with fantasy with a quarterback like Derek Carr, who's not going to be pushing the ball down the field as often as you would like. I think he, he can do more, but I, I don't want to rely on, all right, man, hopefully he hits that 90-yard slant for a touchdown this game. Like that That's not what I want to rely on. I think that's going to be what he's used on uh, the most, is, you know, crosses, slants, things like that. But with, with somebody with speed like Ruggs, I want him to be paired with a quarterback who's going to be willing to take those shots downfield. And Carr might do that every once in a while, but he's not going to do it often enough where that's like where you're going to be like, all right, if he can just connect on one of these four shots, like I don't think he's going to be getting four deep targets per game by any means. So I, like I said, I, I think he is more than just a deep threat, but with someone with his speed, you do not want to hamstring him with a quarterback like Derek Carr. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, if they get really creative with him and, and uh, scheme him into space and allow him to use his agility and what he's able to do when once he gets the ball in his hands, like a la what the Chiefs kind of did with Tyree Kill his rookie year, then maybe there, there's some there's something to be had there. But again, I kind of agree with you. But if he continues to go ninth, 10th round, like some of that's already baked out of it um, in terms of that. But it's going to be really hard probably, I would assume, on most weeks to be able to figure out when you're going to play him. I would rather take a shot if I wanted to take some rookie wide receivers, not named Justin Jefferson or Jerry Judy. I would probably rather take a shot of like a Michael Pittman who's going later than him and a Denzel Mims that's going later than him yeah. that are both guys that I think also have a uh, relative opportunity to ha have an opportunity this year. And then also Brian Edwards, because this is a Brian Edwards fan, uh, podcast. Brian Edwards is a beast. And I think, again, I still think there's the opportunity there that he could end up being the best wide receiver the Raiders drafted. I think that's all we have on our list. And I think that's pretty much what we got for tonight. Head over to Slack. Uh, we, we got a free Slack channel. Yeah, absolutely yeah. Free. A lot of people charge you for that. It's part of their Patreon or it's a part of their, their premium service. It's absolutely free. We can talk about fantasy football all day. I know with everything that's going on in the world, a lot of craziness, that sometimes it's nice just to escape from that and to be able to just talk about football or talk about anything. We, talk, we have DFS. We have Dynasty. We have Redraft. Uh, best ball. We pretty much have every channel for everything. I think there's even a gaming channel that I don't know if anybody uses. But other than that, we're all always there. We all love to talk football. There's a lot of people in there. There's a lot of people on Twitter that are in there that are uh, some other analysts that are in there. So uh, it's absolutely free. It's in the show notes, whether it's on whether you're watching this through YouTube, whether you're watching or listening to this on the podcast, it's always in there. Just click the link, automatically join and get you in there. It's absolutely free, like I said. So it doesn't cost you anything. If you don't like it, all right. So with that being said, I really appreciate everybody checking out the show. Um, next week, we're going to be going into, uh, I believe it's going to be our quarterback rankings. We're going to be talking about our top 12 quarterbacks. So excited to get into that. Like I said, we're finally here. We're finally in redraft season. It's absolutely here. In a couple of months, people will be drafting. Even actually less than about a month and a half from now, people are really going to start drafting. So, um, again, I really appreciate everybody checking out the show. And with that, you can follow me on Twitter at FantasyRat13. You can follow Cody at FF. And until next week, peace.